In our last episode, we passed a challenge inside the Temple of Trials to become the chosen one of our tribe. Our tribe, Arroyo, is slowly dying. The elder of our town heard that before the war, vault Tech invented a nearly magical device called the Garden of Eden Creation Kit, or GEC, a terraforming device that could revitalize our tribal town of Arroyo. Our ancestor, the Vault Dweller, founded the town of Arroyo, and legend has it that he came from one of these Vault Tech vaults, a vault called Vault 13. The Elder doesn't know the location of Vault 13, but one day a traveling tradesman named Vic came into town, and he handed her a strange metal flask emblazoned with the number 13. It stands to reason that this traitor Vic knows the location of Vault 13. Vault 13, which is our best chance of finding a Gek. The traitor Vic was last seen at the nearby town of Klamath, and so we, the Chosen One, head off into the wasteland to reach this Klamath in search of the traitor Vic. Klamath is not far away. We'll likely only stumble upon one random encounter along the way, if any. Despite coming from the west, we arrive on the eastern end of town. Upon entry, we find a sandwich board filled with all sorts of useful information. We see some ads, job notices, and even a drawing, but it looks as if everything on this sandwich board has been here for quite some time. Inspecting the drawing, we see that it appears to be the picture of a Brahmin with a big X drawn through it, and the word Tor T-O-R-R, -R, scrawled beneath it. We see a job listing from a guy named Whiskey Bob. He says that he needs help refueling his still. And if we'd like to help him, we can find him at Ma Buckner's place. There's an advertisement for a nearby bathhouse, which features the handiwork of the beautiful and talented Jenny. See big-nosed Sal at the bathhouse for more exciting details. Oh dear, sounds like it's one of those bathhouses. We find an advertisement from someone wanting to buy lizard hides. They're paying top dollar for gecko pelts, even more for golden gecko pelts. If we have any to sell, we need to talk to Sajag, the owner and operator of the Golden Gecko Tavern. We then find a notice about rats. There are too many rats in Trapper Town. Come on and get them all you can eat. Slim. Oh man, are the people of Klamath really resorting to eating rats? Then we find an advertisement, Genuine Antiques. Okay, did they spell Genuine Antiques, Genuine Antiques? They don't make them like they used to. U-S-T-A, used to. In fact, they mostly don't make these things at all. If you want good old stuff, see Vic the Trader, east side of downtown. There he is, Vic the Trader, the guy we came looking for. He needs a spelling lesson, but I'm sure he'll be able to tell us where Vault 13 is. And finally, we see a missing persons report. It appears that a trapper named Smiley has gone missing. The advertisement describes him as about six feet tall, clean, and housebroken, mostly. He disappeared up north and I kind of miss him, Arden Buckner. <laughs> okay, well, at least Arden cared enough about the guy to post this notice. So we have a lot to do. We'll start by talking with this guy standing by the Brahmin pen. We learn that his name is Aldo and he's the town greeter. He's happy to give us answers, but he requires a tip. He looks a bit drunk. We can say, here's a tip, stay off the booze. In which case he ignores us, but we can give him five bucks to open up. When we ask him that we're looking for a trader named Vic, he says that he hasn't seen Vic in a while and that he's likely run off somewhere. Oh, great. That means we're not gonna find him here in Klamath. He then says that we may want to go and talk with Jenny over at the bathhouse. She and Vic were pretty thick. Ha ha ha, get it? Oh my, I haven't lost my touch. He's very proud of that rhyme. Well, that's just great. Still, we should probably stop by Vic's antique shop to see if we can find any clues. Heading north of here, we see the Buckner house, but before we can go any further, a tribal walks out into the courtyard. We learn that this is Tor. He must be the author of that thoughtful Brahmin graffiti that we saw on the sandwich board. When we ask him if anything has been going on recently, he says, bug men take moo-moos at night. Tor scared. Help Tor? 
However, this conversation goes much differently if our character has low intelligence. With the low intelligence pathway, the Chosen One can have an intelligent conversation with Tor. From him, we can learn exactly where Vic went, but not if we have normal intelligence. All right, so some sort of bug creatures are attacking his Brahmin at night. If we agree to help, he points off to the east and says that the Moomoos are grazing in the Moomoo field. If we agree to help, the screen fades to black and we arrive at the field. Tor comes with us. Surveying the area, we don't see any big bug men attacking these Brahmin. Though looking off to the southeast, we do find a small pack of scorpions. Could this be what Tor was talking about? As we get closer, they do attack us, but they're not that dangerous. We fought scorpions like these in the Temple of Trials. Really, the only thing to fear is getting poisoned by these guys. But we should still have some antidote left over from the Temple of Trials. If we kill all the scorpions, that's it. We can go back to Tor and tell him of our success. He says, Tor like Oxhorn. Tor think. Bugmen bad. Not let Bugmen eat Moomoos. For guarding the Brahmin, we earn 240 experience and plus 50 karma. But that is only one way to complete this quest. If we look off to the left, we see two men hiding in the trees. These are the Dunton brothers, Chuck and Buck. But they look so similar that it's hard to tell them apart. Together they run a meat jerky business, and therefore Tor's Brahmin are of particular interest to them. What the heck are you doing here, they say. They have a job for us if we're interested. The Dunton brothers ask us to rustle the Brahmin. They describe them as, quote, liberating some of the Brahmin from that idiot Tor. We can complete this task any way we want. We can talk him out of the Brahmin or knock him out, but they do ask us not to hurt him too bad. They don't want us to stir up a ruckus in town. If, after agreeing, we lose our nerve and try to tell them that we don't want any part in this plan, they call us yellow and a coward and tell us to get back there and get rid of the idiot Tor. So heading on over to Tor, we can tell him a lie. We can say that we saw some bug men just on the other side of a nearby rock. As a friend, we can say, I'll watch the Moo Moos for you while you go run for help. Tor buys the story hook, line, and sinker. He runs off, leaving us alone with the Brahmin. When he's gone, we can head back to the Dunton brothers, who are still hiding nearby. If we demand our cut of the rustle, they give us 50 bucks and five pieces of jerky. Dunton's dry meat. To leave, we can head south, but on our way out, we pass by a small shack to the east. Heading inside, we find a shelf with some more jerky inside, and then on the ground, we find two scorpion limbs. At last, we realize what's been really going on here. The Dunton brothers had been putting on these scorpion limbs at night, dressing up like half men, half scorpions, or bug men, just as Tor said. So Tor's not as thick as we thought. He really did see Bugmen, or what he thought were Bugmen. Their goal, of course, was to scare Tor to keep him away from the Brahmin herd so that they could rustle him. Back at town, we can head up into the Buckner house. The man in the green shirt sitting at the table is Whiskey Bob. He's the guy that was asking for help on the sandwich board. But despite needing our help, he refuses to talk with us unless we buy him a drink. I guess that's how he got his name, Whiskey Bob. He says that he has a side business that's in trouble. See, he's got this moonshine still outside town, and it needs to be constantly refueled, or else he can't make his moonshine. But a gecko recently bit his leg, and he's too wounded to make it out to his still to refuel it. If we head out to his still and refuel it, he'll give us 50 bucks. To refuel the still, we need to find his shack that's south of town. Then we need to find some firewood to refuel the still. However, after accepting this quest, we have to complete it within 24 hours. Otherwise, his hooch will go bad. So we've got a ticking clock. But we should have enough time to talk with a few people first. Next to Whiskey Bob is Arden Buckner. The first thing she does is ask us if we've seen a trapper named Smiley. We recall from the sandwich board that she's the one that reported him missing. She kind of misses him and kind of wants him back. Turns out the two of them are kind of a couple. She finally convinced him to get serious and settle down with her, but then he up and disappears. 
said he had to go out on one last quest. You see, he's an adventurer, and he thought he discovered the source of the golden geckos. Golden gecko hides are extremely valuable, so he ran off to find the golden gecko source to strike it rich. He thought they might have come from some sort of magical spring or a hidden vault, but he hasn't come back, and in fact, he's two weeks late. If we tell her that we'll keep our eyes open for him, she thanks us and marks his location on our map. We can now visit the Toxic Caves, but let's finish exploring Klamath first. Now, if we chose to rustle the Brahmin from Tor, when we talk with Arden Buckner here, we learn that Tor is also missing. He took off last night, she said. I got mad at him after we lost those last few Brahmin. We just can't afford to lose any more, but all he would talk about is the bug men taking them. That fool boy, she says. Wow, now we have so much to do. Before heading out, let's finish exploring Buckner's. We find Arden's daughter, Maida, on the opposite side of the room. She is described as being a plain-looking, sturdily built young woman with a scowl on her face. She doesn't seem particularly interested in answering our questions, but we can ask anyway. If we ask her about the Garden of Eden creation kit, we discover some of her prejudices. She says that the only way to create a Garden of Eden is through plain old hard work, which is something she says tribals just don't seem to understand. She considers herself to be much more civilized. We see another tribal in the corner of this room. We learn that his name is Sulik. When we ask her about Sulik, she says that Sulik is a tribal who's working here to pay off a debt that he owes her. She's quick to say, however, that he's not a slave. They don't have slaves here in Klamath. We learn that Sulik incurred his debt after he got upset here in the bar one night, had too much booze, and busted up the place. He incurred nearly $500 worth of damage. The reason he got upset is he found out that his sister had been kidnapped by slavers, but she doesn't know anything else about the story. Of that $500, he's only worked off about $150. He still owes them $350. We can offer to pay off the rest of Sulik's debt, but that's $350 which I didn't have at the time. We'll need to find a way to get 350 bucks by scavenging from the town. Next, we can talk with the tribal Sulik. What can we and I do you for? We and I? Who's we? The spirits with me, friend. They be all around. Sometimes talk. What spirits? Spirits be everywhere. Travel with we and I. Grampy Bone do most of talking. Who's Grampy Bone? Him strong spirit. Much honor carrying him. Wait, you mean that bone in your nose? Keep him close. Easier to touch his spirit. That's why he talked the most. Okay, he keeps his grandfather's bone in his nose. That's brilliant. Well, hey, can I ask you some questions? We and I know many things. Travel from great salt water to home of biting lizards. Tell me about the great salt water. The tribe's home is next to great salt water. Two moons from here, friend. Two moons, huh? That's a long way. How'd you travel so far so safely? Friend, with all the spirits walking with me, not afraid to travel anywhere. Biting lizards? Geckos. The little dudes don't bite hard. It's the goldens. They go through your leg like an old pipe stem. Ah, now we can see why Whiskey Bob was so injured. So why did you travel so much? Trader named Vic supposed to be here. He be saying he know about slavers. We show up, didn't peep him. Get pretty hot. Ah, so Sulik is looking for Vic too. Why are you here looking for slavers? Slavers got our sis. Thought Vic be having information. Couldn't peep him. Got peeled. Drank like a fish. Spirits of anger and chaos pop out and now we have to pay some coin to make it right. Okay, so he got mad when he found out that Vic wasn't here, got drunk, and trashed the place. That's why he owes Maida 500 bucks. So you were looking for Vic the Traitor? Vic the Traitor, more like. Comes to village, says he knows about slavers. Tells us to come see him. We go. He ain't there. Your sister was taken by slavers? Sis went trading at another village and never come back. We and I go look for her. What did you find at the other village? One survivor. Dude was in bad shape. Said evil warriors came with magic torches. Fire would lick tribe warriors and they'd go to the spirit. What about your sister? 
the evil warriors tied up the rest and took off. Sis with them. Friend, we be finding her or die and trying. That sure sounds like slavers to me. Have you found anything out about them? We and I know they're slavers at Din. When we're free, we're out of here. Slavers at the Den? But he can't go after them because he's stuck here to pay off that debt. Even if we know, we can ask him how much he owes. We owe made a $350. You're heading south? We'll walk about with you and look for sis. You having $350? <laughs> well, that's a kind offer, Sulik. We could really use a companion, but I don't have that kind of money yet. Let's put a pin in that, come back to it. Hey, in the meantime, maybe you can answer some questions about town. Where can I find trade, a healer, or a room? So many questions. Maida takes care of trade here, and her mother, Arden, takes care of the rooms. No shaman in town, but you may be able to trade for medicine. Have you ever heard of the Garden of Eden creation kit? Never heard of it. But Maida's been keeping us busy. Who's Maida? She's the boss. We pay off and go find Sis. What's going on in town? Oh, <laughs> busy place. Bug men snatching cattle. Spirits walking. Smiley missing. Why don't you tell me about the bug men? Tor be telling us about bugs that walk on two feet and steal Brahmin. Shook him up. Walking spirits? Tell me about that. The canyon east of Herd area is supposed to have a walking, howling spirit, shaking the locals. Grampy Bone don't say a word, though. Well, I don't like the sound of that. What about this Smiley who's gone missing? Smiley's a good hunter. Say he looking for the golden gecko's nest. Didn't come back. Well, poor old Sulik here is looking for his kidnapped sister, and he got stuck here in Klamath. We need to somehow drum up 350 bucks to help him out and find Smiley, and avoid a walking spirit, and fix Whiskey Bob still, and figure out where Vic went. Oh man, there's a lot on our plate. While inspecting this inn, we can try to scrounge up some gear to sell. Inside a desk in the eastern room, we find a stim pack and 45 bucks. North of this, we find a locked door. After picking it, we find a bunch of storage. Crates, boxes, barrels, and containers. And on the ground, we find a golden gecko pelt. Grabbing the pelt, we'll sell it later. Back out into the southern room, we find a bookshelf. Here we find four gecko pelts, and we've made a good start. Talking with Meta, we can sell the loot that we have, but she only has 62 caps on her inventory. So we're not gonna get to the full 350 unless we find another merchant. We don't find much else in the other hotel rooms, so we'll leave Buckner's to explore the rest of Klamath. But remember, we've got to do so within the next 24 hours or we fail Whiskey Bob's quest. Heading south, we see a building with a big Blades advertisement. We remember that from Fallout 1. We just find drifters and townsfolk wandering around. In the southwestern room, we find a bookshelf, and inside, two flares, some fruit, and throwing knives. Heading out, we can explore the building to the south. We don't find anything in this room, but just outside, we find an angry dog. After seeing us, it follows us inside. Grr, woof, woof, grr. Our only option is to stare into the dog's eyes and go, grr, arg, grr. But then the dog turns hostile and attacks. I really didn't want to kill the dog. So racing out of the building and running south, we can zone into the southern trapping grounds. This is where Whiskey Bob has his still. But we just zoned out here to lose aggression. We'll go look for that still a bit later. Heading back to that southern room and avoiding the dog, we find a footlocker at the base of a bed with some healing powder and a flower inside. Moving to the northern side of town, we can explore the small middle building. Here we find the Dunton Brothers. Looks like when they're not rustling cattle, they have a shop here selling some of their jerky. He asks us if we'd like to buy some of his jerky, which he calls dry meat. When we ask about it, he says that his dry meat is an incredible blend of 11 herbs and spices. It's finger licking good, and animals love it too. They'll chase you all over town to get some. Oh, that's why the dog chased us into that room. When we ask him to tell us more, he says it's made from people. But then he laughs. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Just kidding. I wanted to see your expression. Okay, haha. Ha. Funny guy. We can barter with him. On his inventory, we find a copy of Cat's Paw Magazine. 
It's important to loot as many of these as we can find early in the game, as they will become important to collect later. He, like Maida, has 65 caps on his inventory to barter with, so selling what we can, we can buy him out. In the back of the room, he does have a bookshelf, but if we try to loot it, and if we're not sneaky enough, he'll attack. But if we come back at night while the Denton brothers are at the Golden Gecko Tavern, we can loot the place. The bedroom door is locked, but if we can pick it, we find quite a stash in the bookshelf. Another Cat's Paw magazine, three pieces of jerky, a Molotov cocktail, some beer whiskey, and more gecko pelts. Moving back out to the shop floor, we can loot the bookshelf behind the counter where we find more jerky. To the north, we find a fenced off area and a small outhouse. Inside the outhouse, we find a copy of Cat's Paw magazine. Remember, this is the magazine we want to collect. Heading into the pen, we can go south to walk through a door into this nearby building. There's food in the refrigerator and a bunch of slaughtered Brahmin all over the ground. So this is the Dunton Brothers Slaughterhouse, where they make all of their dried meats. Disturbingly, we find a golden gecko corpse on the ground and a dead pig rat on the ground. So it's not just Brahmin meat we're eating, we're eating pig rat and gecko. In a locker, we find more of their dry meat and a combat knife. As we continue to explore, we find a pile of bones on the ground. I can't even tell what animal these belong to. And more bodies just lying here rotting. I don't think I'm in the mood for any more dry meat. So avoiding that, and now that we have the jerky, we can head south to try to find that dog. When we find him, we again have the option to stare into his eyes and growl and bark, but we found out what happens when we do that last time. Instead, we find an option to say, you're just hungry, aren't you, boy? Let me see if I have some delicious dry meat to give you. The dog barks happily and opens his mouth to eat the dry meat, but as he does, a key falls out of his mouth. I wonder why he was carrying it around, or maybe it got stuck in his mouth and it was causing pain. At any rate, we now have a key. Time to find out what this key is for. We also have a temporary companion. The dog now follows us all over the place, and we now have all the cash we need to pay off Sulik's debts. Heading back to the Buckner house, we can talk with Sulik. What can we and I do you for? I'm here to pay off your debt. Here's the 350 bucks. Yeah, we be giving this to Maida, then we be free. Want us to walk by and by? That would be great, Sulik. With that, we essentially purchase his freedom. And we now have two companions, Sulik and the dog. But the dog won't stick with us for very long. As soon as we zone out of this place, he leaves. But with Sulik's help here, we can finish our quests much more quickly. Perhaps we can actually survive all of those geckos in the trapping ground. But first, we'll finish exploring all of these buildings. Heading to the northwesternmost building, we find the Golden Gecko Tavern Hotel and Trading Post, run by Sajag. We remember Sajag's name from the sandwich board. He has a much bigger inventory than Maida and the Dunton brothers. We can actually get some gear from him, and he has 130 bucks to barter with. After trading, we can ask him some questions. He tells us of a few towns nearby. He describes our hometown of Arroyo, and he gives us the location of the den, which is a few days south of here. That's where Sulik's trying to go to find any trace of his sister. Then he tells us about the mining town of Redding, far away to the southwest. He tells us about Vic the Trader and about his house on the eastern end of town, but again says that he hasn't seen Vic in a while, though he does say that Vic trades at the den from time to time. He then tells us a story about R-O-U-S's, rodents of unusual size. Some say there's a giant rat the size of a Corvega that rules over all the rats in Trapper Town. He lives in an old mine beneath Trapper Town, and that other rats bring him many shiny objects that they find. He strangely then licks his lips and says, mmm, shiny baubles. Okay, weirdo. We learned the location of the canyon with the walking spirits. It's just west of town. He says that a few months ago, a bright light came from the canyon. And then critters all over town started disappearing. They found many tracks leading to the canyon, but no tracks ever coming out. Some say they hear a weird whining sound echoing from the canyon walls. Oh, no walking spirits, disappearing animals, and a whining sound? I think I want to steer clear of that canyon. 
Before we leave, we see a tall, graying man with a tankard of ale sitting at one of the tables. As soon as we talk with him, he says that he can tell by the way we are walking that we could use some pointers. When we ask him pointers with what, he says, well, about sweet science, of course. Sweet science, we say? Do you mean you can teach us magic? He grins broadly and says, yes, I can teach you about the wee folk, the leprechauns, the spriggans, banshees, and the like. Would you like that? If we say yes, he looks at a nearby patron, whispers, and says, Did you hear that? I've got myself a live one here. Wants to hear about the fairies and the wee goblins and such. He laughs and then says, Here, have a drink on me. That's your ticket to the realm of the fae folk. But the drink is just the start. You see, to learn this magic, we have to find a fairy mound. We sit at the mound and then wait until we can see a fairy circle in the dew. Then if we jump into the fairy ring, we'll be made to dance until dawn with the wee folk. If we survive the all-night dancing, they'll steal us away to the land of fairy. When we ask him how he knows so much about fairy magic, he says, Oh, it's in me blood, of course. Erin Gobra. But that's just one way to have this conversation. Back at the start of the conversation, instead of asking him if by science he meant magic, we asked, What are you talking about? We learned that it wasn't about the art of magic. He wanted to teach us about the art of pugilism, the manly art of hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's what he meant. We can reject his offer by saying we already know more than him, or we could say, sure, I could use some help with that. He says, all right, the key is to get your whole body to snap like a whip. It fades to black. And by nightfall, we've earned 150 experience. And John Sullivan here, for that is his name, has improved our melee and unarmed combat skills by 10%. We were lucky to meet him. He was once famous as a boxer from New Reno. We can thank him by buying him a $10 brew. And he says, it was my pleasure. You take care of yourself now. And if anyone asks, just tell them that fighting John Sullivan taught you how to fight that way. So... Just don't talk with Fightin' John Sullivan about magic, and all goes well. Whew. Exploring the inn, we find some money and booze in one of the bookshelves. At night, the Dunton brothers hang out at the Golden Gecko Tavern. If we try to talk to them, they challenge us to an arm wrestling match. If we succeed, they buy us a drink. While talking with them, we can get them to confess their entire scam using the scorpion arms to dress up like bug men. And if we haven't completed the Brahmin quest yet, we can get Rustling the Brahmin here from the Dunton Brothers. But since we've completed it, we'll move on. Now that we've explored the center of town, we can start on some of these quests. Heading south from the Buckner house, we find a ruined building. We can loot a Nuka-Cola and a Guns and Bullets magazine from a nearby bookshelf. Heading south, we arrive at the large field where Whiskey Bob has his still. We see the shack down to the south, but the place is swarming with geckos. No wonder he got bitten. But with Sulik's help, we make short work of them. Sulik prefers melee. He comes with a sledgehammer, and during combat, we'll frequently knock enemies back, forcing them to use more of their action points. At his maximum level, he'll have 12 action points, the highest of all possible companions in the game. He can use some weapons, like the 223 pistol and the 14mm pistol, and he's proficient with SMGs, like the HNK G11E and the HNK P90C. However, it's dangerous to give any companion an automatic weapon because they are not careful with burst damage and can easily kill the chosen one or our other companions. So melee weapons and either the 223 pistol or the 14 millimeter pistol are the best options. At length, we clear a path to Whiskey Bob's shack. Heading inside, we see his still, but it's not functioning. To get it working, we needed to find some firewood. We find a stack of firewood to the south. After looting it, we can use it on the still. It sounds as though the hooch is distilling nicely now, and we gain 100 experience for refueling the still. When done, we can head out, kill any more geckos along our way, and return to Whiskey Bob at the Buckner house. Thanks, he says, now I don't have to go out there myself, even if it did cost me 65 bucks. And he hands us our fee. After completing his quest, he opens up and tells us more news from around town. He does tell us more about Trapper Town, saying that it has become overrun with rats, and the rats appear to get bigger the deeper you get. 
Some say that there is one huge great rat spirit that's leading them all. The rats are even scaring away the trappers. They say it's not safe to stay there anymore. He tells us more about the den, describing it as a hive of human scum and villainy. If interested, we can find it a few days travel south of Klamath. They sell anything, even slaves there. But we have to be careful because the people of the den have short tempers. He again corroborates what we learned from Sajak that Vic was last seen traveling south to the den and that he never returned. He also tells us the direction that Smiley was last seen traveling. He went off north in search of the source of the golden geckos. Before continuing on with our quests, there were a few more buildings here in town that we missed. Directly north of the Buckner house is the bathhouse. Inside we find one woman. Before we go any further, she says, you've got to know that the baths are for individuals, not groups. You can make your own arrangements, and then your friends can do as they please on their own. Okay, so we're not doing uh, group <clears throat> sessions. We learn that her name is Sally Dunton, but everyone calls her Big Nose Sally. They have an assortment of special attended baths that we can pick from. They don't do unattended baths. We can always take those at the Golden Gecko or the Buckner House. But she says, I doubt you'll find those baths quite as enjoyable. The special attended baths vary in cost by the amount of time that the female attendant spends with us and uh, any other special services we choose to take advantage of. Their menu breaks down like this. On the lowest end, they have the washcloth hand wipe. Then there's the brief full body wash. And finally, the round the world full squeaky clean servicing, offered only by the beautiful and talented Jenny, recently trained at the finest house in the den. The hand wipe costs $25. The full body wash is 70 bucks. When we ask her about the round the world full squeaky clean wash, she says that we're actually too filthy for that. Before we can get that wash, we need to be scrubbed down by someone named Gerda first. Then we'll get the squeaky clean services from Jenny. The whole package is 105 bucks. We can say, wait a minute, is Gerda that large mustachioed woman? And we can back out, or we can say, I'm ready to enjoy Jenny's services. The screen fades to black, and we arrive in the nearby bedroom that suspiciously has no bath. Here we find Jenny. Gee, mister, she says, that was pretty quick. You must be pretty new at this sort of thing. Just relax a bit and you'll enjoy it more. Kali. Our only option is to say, thanks, Jenny. I guess I need some more practice at this. After that humiliating exchange, we can finally ask her some questions. Remember, the whole point of our coming here is to ask her about Vic. She and Vic had a special relationship. She tells us that trappers come here often. They spend all day hunting geckos. If they're lucky, they'll find a golden one. Then they come here to unwind. She says that she likes them because they're usually pretty quick. Then when we ask about Vic, she says that she really liked him. He always had extra money to blow. She calls him a real sweetheart and corroborates what we've already learned, that he would make frequent trips to the den. Even though she was trained at the den, she doesn't have anything good to say about the place, describing it as a hive of scum and villainy to the southwest of here. It was dangerous but exciting, and she's half sorry that she had to leave. She has absolutely no idea what we are talking about if we ask about the Gek. And that's it for Jenny. Heading out, we can return to the foyer and then open a door to the back. This leads to a hallway in the room to the left. We find a box that has booze in it. Heading back out to the hallway, we can open each of these rooms. In each room is a prostitute. We can't have a conversation, but they will try to flirt with us. When done, we can leave the bathhouse, head back outside. We can go to the eastern side of town to finish exploring this section. There is one bathroom to the south, but nothing here. And opening the door to the right, we can finally explore what should be Vic's antique shop. In the dresser, we find whiskey, booze, Nuka Cola, a stack of playing cards for playing Tragic the Gathering, and three Vault 13 water flasks. So this is Vic's home. 
And to have an entire stack of these Vault 13 water flasks means he must at some point have been to Vault 13. But he's no longer here, and all evidence tells us that he was last seen at the den. Moving to the east, we find a bookshelf. Inside, we find a pipe rifle, a radio, and 10 millimeter ammunition. This pipe rifle is our first rifle, but its ammo capacity is one, which means we have to reload it after every shot. I suppose it's useful until we find a decent pistol. Now we need to complete our quests. Heading to the southeast, we take the exit grid to Trapper Town. This is the part of town where the trappers like to hang out. At night, we find a bunch of them standing around a fire here saying, what are you doing? They are wary of us, saying they don't have much left for us to steal here. Heading north, we see that Trapper Town is much like a slum. The trappers must not make a lot of wealth from all of their trapping. This complex of buildings is comprised of a number of rooms where the trappers are living. We explore each of them until, while exploring the room on the northwestern side of the furthest building to the right, we find a very tall and lanky trapper. This is Slim Pickett the leader of the trappers in Trapper Town. We learn that the trappers are being tormented by a bunch of rats here in Trapper Town. That's why they've barricaded some of the streets and blocked off some of the rooms, trying to contain the rat issue. He says that most of the rats are coming from a basement to the north, but it's locked. He has the key. If we express interest in becoming a trapper ourselves, he kind of poo-poos the idea, saying that he doesn't think we'd do a very good job. But he offers to teach us his own trapping skills for 50 bucks. With that, he increases our outdoorsman skill if our outdoorsman skill is less than 29%. After this, he becomes much more willing to talk with us. He tells us more about geckos. Regular geckos are pretty easy to kill, but the golden ones are nasty. They have a strong and poisonous bite. That's one reason why their pelts are worth so much more. He tells us more about Smiley, who's gone missing, again corroborating what we've heard already, that he went somewhere to the north. He says that he has quite a collection of old pre-war cars. He even has a Chrysler Highwayman that we can see propped up on cinder blocks to the right. It's a beautiful car. He loves looking at it, but he can't figure out a way to get to it. He also mentions a giant rat god. It's just rumor, he says, but he's still gone ahead and locked the only door to the old abandoned mine beneath Trapper Town. And he says that he has the only key, but that abandoned mine is exactly where we need to go. If our steel skill is high enough, we can steal it from him. Or we can barter with him. This also gives us access to his inventory and we can take it for zero dollars. Or if we play a female chosen one, we can sleep with him for the key. But we don't need to do any of that because we have a key already. The key we found in the dog's mouth that he dropped when we gave him the dry meat is none other than a copy of the key here on Slim's inventory. We can use it to access the mine. After exploring the rooms in the northern section of this building, we can go back to head out a door. The path to the north is blocked. This is one of the barricades Slim told us he made. But from here, we can explore the building to the left and head south, cross a parking lot towards a shack on the southwestern side of town. This shack is right next to a bunch of barrels and a crimson caravan sign. Heading inside, we find a locked door. And going outside, we find another locked door on the western side of the building. If we pick it, inside we find a trunk on the floor, and inside the trunk, two golden gecko pelts and six regular gecko pelts. Quite a haul. Just outside, we find a kid running around who begins to follow us around. He races after us saying, you're a nice tribal, not like the others. Do you have some food? Are you married? What's your name? Do you have kids? And generally just being annoying. But he stops pestering us once we head back into the building. The rooms in this large middle structure don't have anything interesting, and the alleyway is blocked off. So to continue north, we have to go back into Slim's building and out the doorway to the north. To the northeast, we see a former gun shop. Heading through the door, we can examine some of the shelves. We find a pair of boots in the left locker, some 10 millimeter ammunition in the middle locker, and another pair of boots in the right locker. These will become important later. Heading out of the gun shop, the door to the north leads to a room that's empty, which forces us to take the alleyway back south. Here we find two doors, a door immediately to the left, and a door and a wall to the south. 
taking the door and the wall to the south first. We can loot many of the rooms down here. We find a skeleton, but it's empty. We do find a door to the west leading out to a small warehouse that we can explore. Inside the warehouse, we find a number of empty shelves, but we also find a Nuka-Cola machine, but we can't interact with this one. So heading back into the large sprawling building, we can retrace our steps and take the final door on the left side of the alleyway. This leads to a number of rooms connected by doorways and broken walls that are infested with rats. We find dozens of them here. They're not challenging, they just take up an enormous amount of time. At last, we arrive at the northernmost room, and here we find the corpse of a strong peasant. There's nothing on his inventory, but if these rats could kill even a strong peasant, what can they do to us? At the far end of the room, we find a ladder going down into the rat-infested mine. Below ground, we find a room to the north. Inside a desk here, we find some 10 millimeter ammunition. There's some big machine to the south, partially blocking our way. These pathways are all filled with rats. It takes a lot of time to cut our way through them. After killing some rats in a little nook, we find a bunch of cardboard boxes. The game even wonders how these cardboard boxes could have survived so long. There are nothing but rats taking the path to the north. So going south, we find a split. We fight more rats if we take the path to the south, and taking the path to the north, we find another ladder going deeper into the earth. But before we go down there, let's finish exploring this level. Taking the northern path to the right, we fight through a number of rats until we find a bunch of irradiated nuclear storage barrels. But that's a dead end, so retracing our steps, we can take the path to the right, whereupon we find a pile of bones. And on the bones, a crowbar. We can take the path south to complete the loop and clear all the rats. This leaves one path remaining, and that's to take the ladder down to the next level. As soon as we arrive, we fight even more rats. To the south, we find some tough pigs, slightly more challenging than the rats. And it's just as the town folk said, the rats in the abandoned mine just look tougher and tougher. And if they were right about that, could they be right about the rat god? On the southern path, amongst a bunch of rubble, we find a container of 10 millimeter jacketed hollow point ammunition. Fighting our way to the east, we eventually find the rat god. He charges at us from a nearby room, but thankfully, with Sulik's help, we pick him off before he can even reach us. After killing him, we learn his name was King Raat. And by killing him, we earn 300 experience. After killing the rat god, we can continue to clear these corridors and small rooms. In a tiny nook to the north, we find a body on the ground. He had a small amount of cash and a 10 millimeter pistol. Exploring all the way to the north, we find a ladder that brings us up one level. We have to fight through and clear yet another winding series of pathways. Even though the rat god is dead, these rats are still hostile and we find more tough pigs. On the southern side, we find a locker with $20 and two stim packs inside. And after clearing the path to the far right, we find a box of ammunition on the ground next to an empty skeleton. Taking the path to the north, we find a shelf with some dynamite and another crowbar. Just above this, we find a locked door. If we can pick it, we find a ladder, which brings us topside. We arrive in a small shack on the other side of the Klamath fence, an area we can't get to any other way. Leaving the building to the south, we find a Nuka-Cola machine against this wall, but this one has a unique description compared to the last one. This one says, you wonder if it still works. With that hint, we scrounge through our inventory for a coin. Putting the coin in the machine, we hear thunk, thunk, ka-ching, true, and we dodge a can of Nuka-Cola that shoots out of it. We can now pick up the can nearby. There's a big wrecked car out here, a building to the northwest, which may have been a school at some time. In the fridge, we find two bottles of Nuka-Cola and a beer. The building directly south of this one is empty. And heading all the way to the south, we see that wrecked Corvega highway, man, that Slim has been admiring through the fence. If we examine it, we learn that the machine is in bad shape, but that there's a package in the back seat. If we loot it, we find the fuel injection system of a Corvega Highwayman. We don't know what this is for at the moment, but we'll save this for later. 
However, we have reached a dead end. Slim never got here, because there's no gate in the fence leading to the highwayman. So to get back to town, we have to go back into the shack and retrace our steps all the way through the rat warren. Back to Trapper Town, we can talk to Slim. He says, you're just a regular Pied Piper, aren't ya? Thank ye. Passing the trappers by the campfire, they don't think too poorly of us anymore. And we can take the exit zone to the east back up to downtown. Next, we need to track down the walking spirits inside the Klamath Canyon. We remember they told us about a whining noise coming from this canyon. And as we enter the canyon, we immediately see what it is. We get attacked by a homicidal Mr. Handy Robot stuck in defense mode that shouts popular catchphrases from science fiction TV and movies. Nanu Nanu from Mork and Mindy. I am sorry, Dave. From Space Odyssey. He can shout a number of phrases from science fiction, including Gort, Klaatu, Barada Nikto from The Day the Earth Stood Still, V'ger, V'ger from Star Trek The Motion Picture, Does Not Compute from Lost in Space, and Danger, Bill Williamson, Danger, which of course is a reference to Lost in Space. Only the robot said Danger Will Robinson. If we come here after having rustled Tor's Brahmin for the Dunton brothers, and after we discovered that Tor went missing, we find that the Mr. Handy robot was keeping Tor captive, or at least was preventing Tor from coming back home. We find Tor here only if we rustled his Brahmin for the Dunton brothers. Otherwise, we'll find the Handy guarding the path alone. At the end of the path, we see a big crashed machine. This is a crashed vertebird. Now we understand the bright light the townsfolk told us about. It was the explosion of this vertebrate crashing. We find the bodies of Enclave soldiers lying here. What on earth is the Enclave? And on one of the bodies, we find a yellow pass card. This pass card has no function in the game. It's a remnant of some cut content from the game. We can loot the card as a collectible, but it has no use. And the critters disappearing. Animal tracks leading into the canyon, but none ever coming out, were geckos and other wildlife lured by the stench of the corpses, but then being killed by the Mr. Handy. Strange we don't see piles of animal bodies here, though. Perhaps they were vaporized. We learn from the events of Fallout New Vegas that this vertebrate was the very vertebrate that belonged to Daisy Whitman. And in fact, she is the one who crashed it here in Klamath Canyon. Vertebrate pilot. 71 missions and only lost one chopper. Rotor malfunction over Klamath. Hard landing, but I walked away. And we also learn that the unique blade that Lily uses in Fallout New Vegas was crafted from one of the blades of this very crashed vertebrate. This old thing? Oh, I scavenged it off a wreck in Klamath. Leo showed me how to make it all ready for chopping. Didn't you, Leo? If we had to rescue Tor in our game, when we head back to Buckner's and talk to Ada, she says, you've found my son Tor. Thank you so much. We can walk away without asking for a reward, or if we have yet to pay off Sulik's debt, we find an option to say, if you could consider Sulik's debt paid, that would be reward enough. She tells us that that's fine and we can check in with Maida. When we do, we find her sobbing. She says that Tor can go, but we learn that she actually really liked him. Despite her prejudice against tribals, she ended up becoming friends with him, and she's sad to see him go. This is one way to get Sulik as a companion without having to spend any money, but we do have to conspire with the Dunton brothers to do so. With Tor rescued, we have one task left to achieve, and that's to discover the whereabouts of Trapper Smiley. Now we remember from talking with many of the residents of Klamath that Trapper Smiley was last seen traveling north to try and track down the source of the golden geckos. We learned the exact location of where he went when we talked with his girlfriend Arden at the Buckner house. So heading out of Klamath, we find a new location just northwest of Klamath called the Toxic Caves. These toxic caves are filled with geckos and the floor of the caves is covered in a thick green toxic goo. This toxic goo will hurt us, but the damage is level dependent. It could devastate us quickly at a really young level, but if we come back at a higher level, it may do negligible damage. But it's still painful, unless we wear 
the rubber boots that we found in the Warrens beneath Trapper Town. Our companions will take damage too, so we need to make sure that Sulik has a pair of boots on his inventory. We don't have to equip them, we just have to have the boots in our inventory. If we don't wear boots, not only will we take damage, but eventually our feet will mutate. And in one month, we'll sprout two extra toes, one on each foot. We'll know when our feet have absorbed enough toxin to mutate toes in about a month. When we see the message, your feet start to burn and itch. From that point on, it's just a matter of time. This toe doesn't really harm us, but we can remove it later. Though extra toe removal isn't cheap. It's also possible for the rubber boots to completely melt, leaving the chosen one or our companions without any protection at all. So if we can find spares, it may be prudent to bring them. To the south, we can open a door to a small room where we find a locker. Inside the locker, we find a stim pack, three flares, some rat away, and more rubber boots. At the end of this level, we find a hole in the ground leading to another level below. This level is filled with toxic irradiated barrels. And of course, more geckos. We have three ways to pass through. We can go north, which is a path that has lots of geckos, but less toxic goo. We can go through the middle of this map, which has plenty of geckos and piles of toxic goo, or we can take the southern path, which pretty much skips almost the whole floor, and there's no toxic goo. At the end, however, we do have to get past a few of these geckos, and then quickly walk across a little bit of toxic goo. At the end, we find an elevator and a room to the south. After opening the door, we find Smiley. Hello there, stranger, he says. People call me Smiley. I'm sure glad to see you. I thought I was going to die here for certain. He had to stay here because he was hurt too bad to get past the geckos. He tells us, as we've heard already, that he came here in search of the source of the gold and geckos. And this must be it. They must have mutated from geckos that lived here. The toxic goo made them into the monsters they are. He managed to get in this room and hide. The geckos didn't go after him because they don't like walking through the goo, though strangely they do enjoy eating it. After rescuing him, he joins us as a temporary companion. Now in the back of this room, we find a computer console. But even using our science skill, we don't learn anything. And if we go to the elevator, we find that it's not powered. We have to get the generator working. We find the generator back in the room where we found Smiley, but it requires a pretty high level of repair to fix it. And so I had to come back here much later in the game with a companion who could repair things for me. But even after repairing the generator, we can't open the elevator door without an electronic lockpick. My character at this time had over 100 in lockpicking, but it still required an electronic lockpick. One of the earliest places to find one is in the basement of a gun shop at New Reno. That's still a ways off in the plot from here, but that electronic lockpick also comes with two pulse grenades, which as we'll soon see, are about to come in very handy. However we get an electronic lockpick, once we have one, we can use it on the elevator door. We can take the elevator down to the first floor. As soon as we open the elevator, we see something to the right. And as we approach it, oh, it's a sentry bot and it's attacking with its entire missile arsenal. This guy is really tricky. He has well over 100 hit points and his missiles can devastate our companions. I managed to finally kill him by throwing a pulse grenade. The pulse grenade does enormous damage against robots and after successfully landing one on him, my companions and I were quickly able to finish him off with our ballistic weapons. Thankfully, the sentry bot is the only guard down here and we find a lot of great stuff. In the room to the left, we find a desk with a copy of Guns and Bullets and a Nuka-Cola. Heading south down the hallway, we pass by a number of storage rooms, but we don't find anything in them until we explore the locker room to the left. In the first locker, we find Rataway, Radex, and Stimpax, and in the second one, we find 200 rounds of 2mm EC, 200 rounds of 4.7mm caseless, and 200 rounds of .223 full metal jacket ammunition. Holy cow, this is some great ammunition, especially for this level. 
The biggest cache is to the south. In the first locker, we find a stack of energy cells and microfusion cells. In the second locker, we find a plasma pistol, a laser pistol, and more energy cells. And in the third locker, we find a Bozar sniper rifle and a full suit of combat armor. We can understand why the developers made it so difficult to get into this room. I had to wait many levels before I came back here to loot the place, so you won't see me using the Bozar rifle or the combat rifle for quite some time. But taking the elevator back up, and with Smiley as a temporary companion, we can carefully tiptoe around the toxic goo and avoid any remaining geckos to leave the toxic caves. Heading back to Klamath, we can go back to the Buckner house to check in with Arden. She says, you're the one who found my Smiley. Thank you so much. I don't have much, she says, but here's $100. She wishes it could be more, but with all the Brahmin they keep losing, that's all they can afford. But our real reward comes when we again talk with Smiley. We see him sitting at a table at the bottom part of the room. I sure owe you for saving my hide, he says. Least I can do is teach you something in return. If we agree, he offers to teach us how to skin geckos so that we can produce our own gecko hides. The training takes about an hour and when done, we can go and skin all the geckos that we've already killed loot their pelts to make a great profit. Smiley tells us that Arden is so happy to have him back that the two of them may get married soon. Klamath is often mentioned during the events of Fall New Vegas. If we head to Westside, we find a man wearing a red cap named Klamath Bob. Howdy. Name's Bob, but folks around here call me Klamath Bob. <laughs> yeah, good old Klamath. Not a bad place if you like hunting, eating, and skinning geckos all day. <laughs> It's a pretty dull place, but I hear there was a bit of excitement when this tribal from Arroyo came to town years back. All before my time, though. And with that, we finish every quest in Klamath, gain Sulik as a new companion, and discovered exactly where Vic went. He went south to the den. We've got to find Vic to see if he knows where Vault 13 is so we can get a Gek for our tribe. In our next video, we will travel south to the den and uncover the seedy horrors of the den's underworld in search of Vic. I publish many videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. They come on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, stickers, mugs, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.